cool. So just by a show of hands, how many of you are uh, in product management roles already? Cool, okay, great. And how many of you guys are in um, startups? Uh, versus, yeah, startups first. Okay, and bigger companies? Cool, okay, so it's a good, good mix of folks. Um, great, well, we, um, we're gonna spend about 20 minutes or so. I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about my journey at Facebook and uh, one specific thing I've learned about product management there. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll just open up for, for questions and uh, hopefully learn a little bit from each other as well. Cool, so let me... So what I want to talk about is uh, kind of a product management approach of what we call people problems first. So at Facebook, we actually don't call our users users, we call them people. So we don't have mo monthly active users, we have monthly active people. And that just that one change in how you talk about the end user changes how you think about the product you're building. At least that was kind of the big um, change for me on how I was perceiving. Like, this is not just a user. I'm trying to get to to do a thing uh, on my website or my on my app, but it's actually a person behind the product that is trying to accomplish a task. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, a little bit about myself. I I'm a product lead for a profile and identity team on Facebook. Um, so it is everything that has to do with your profile when you land on there, with profiles of other people when you get there. It's a uh, second most visited surface on Facebook. Um, it's huge, everyone has it. Um, prior to joining Facebook, I had my own startup for about three to four years. It was in travel and local discovery space. Uh, I'm also a huge USC fan. That's gonna be relevant a little later. Uh, any Trojans in the house? No? It's a bummer, it's a big game tomorrow. Um, Cool, okay, so let's dive in. Um, when we talk about product ideas, there's always this question, like everyone has a different idea of where do product ideas come from? Um, what do you guys think? Like where, how do, how do we PMs, product managers, come up with product ideas? User problems. User problems. Developing customers. Customers, yeah. User needs, cool. Yeah, here. Engineers, yes. Competitors. Competitors, it's a good one. <laughs> yep. Cool. So, so a, a lot of different ways to come up with ideas, right? Um, when uh, when I first started working on products, I thought that you kind of have this like strike of a genius and come up with idea. Uh, and I think a lot of times as a as the first time startup founder, which is how I I enter into product management, you kind of you have this vision or you have this idea and you want to come up with. A, was like a, a way to, to make the world a better place. Um, I also thought that you just get a bunch of people in the room potentially and just brainstorm a bunch of ideas and you come up with something revolutionary and great. Um, it, of course, both of these methods do lead to some good ideas, uh, but as um, many of you probably know, Paul Graham, um, he said something really that really stuck with me even in my start, startup days, which was, why do so many founders build things no one wants? Because they begin by trying to think of startup ideas. Uh, that MO is doubly dangerous. It doesn't merely yield few good ideas, it yields bad ideas that sound plausible enough to fool you into working on them. And when I read that, first I was like, ah, I should have, I wish I read this like four years ago. Um, this is like three, four years into working on my startup. Um, the second, I, it just like resonated so much with me that like it's not about coming up with an idea or a startup idea. It is about thinking about the people problems. And so when I joined Facebook, uh, what I learned very quickly and very early on, and we're lucky to have a huge research team, but what I learned is that it's, it is all about customers. It is all about understanding what are people doing, um, what problems they have, and how do we help them uh, just achieve a task and, and, and be able to have, whether it's a utility or, or some other way to entertain themselves, but they can actually help people figure, like do the thing they're already doing in, in a better way. So but what does that exactly mean? Um, and I joined Facebook, and this is actually an image 
um, we, we used in some of our on onboarding. This is literally what I felt like as a product manager on the first day. It's like, I have no idea. I had a startup where I was like the CEO and the legal and everything else you do. Um, and as a PM at a big company, it was my first time. Um, in November 2014, which is when I joined Facebook, and I joined the profile team, so I was working on some on a product that was very different from what I was working on before, um, that was used by billions of people. Um, and the question uh, that one of the things I had to figure out early on was, well, what is the big next kind of strategic idea we should tackle? Where is the opportunity uh, as a team, as a product, uh, that we should we should go in? And so remembering Paul Graham's quote, I thought, OK, I should not be coming up with an idea. And probably the first step I should take is figure out what's going on with our users today. Um, and so in this kind of journey of like people problems first, the first step is always to look at research. And if you're lucky enough to work at a big company or, or, or a well-funded startup, uh, you probably have some research. You have some uh, uh, capacity to look into uh, how, are, how are users using your product today? And so this is both like look at the past research if you have any, but also uh, doing things like interviews, um, looking, actually it's interesting that like people say like, how do you make decisions based on just like what 10 people said? But the reality is that like after you li listen to like seven or eight, you literally hear the same patterns, like top two or three things come up. You're just like, wow, like this is incredible that you have such a like, usually diverse sample of people, and they all encounter the same problems. Um, and we've, we try to do, I mean, we have a very international user base, and depending on your customer base, try to get the custom, like an interview from customer base that represents people who are using your product. So for us, it's not just folks here in the Bay Area, it is someone um, on a very slow connection in the emerging market, it is someone in maybe in Germany, on a very different network, on very different cultural points of view about the product, how they interact. And so we do research internationally. We do a lot of remote, remote research, as well as bring people in to, um, in, and, and talk to them. So I, we've done all of this. Um, and, uh, and, and this was kind of like the first couple of months on my team before like even diving into building products. I was just trying to understand what's happening. And what, what I saw is that we saw a bunch of different patterns. But one of the things that was very interesting, over and over again, um, from like small towns in Kansas to Cairo to New York, we saw uh, people use profile pictures to show support for things they care about most. And this was fascinating because there's a lot of different themes, but this was just like super international. Almost everywhere we talked to people, we saw examples of kind of just people using this space to express what they care about. Uh, and, and it kind of made sense because in real life, people paint their face uh, with their favorite sports team uh, or wear a t-shirt to support their cause. And, and they were using their profile pictures as a, as a way to kind of express that in their online identity. Um, and it kind of made sense to me because I'm, I'm a USC fan. I wear a lot of, like, for the games, I wear the, the hoodie and sometimes paint my face. Probably going to do that tomorrow. Um, and, and, and you go to the game, right? And so this is, like, online, this is how you represent that same kind of passion. And we see the same thing with causes. People uh, wear, like, same kind of shirts and, and uh, logos to, to show support for different causes that they care about. So when we look at all this research, uh, one of the things we, we saw and we, we kind of had a hunch around this, that this could be big. There's something really interesting here. Um, these people really care about something, about their personality, um, and, and it's something that helps people feel like they belong to a bigger tribe, to something bigger than themselves. And, and something that's also really associated with their core identity, which is what we, like on the profile team, really care about because profile is a place where you can represent yourself in the Facebook community. It's kind of like when you wake up in the morning, you dress up and you go outside and you go to work. How do you like? How do you dress up and how do you want to represent yourself? We enable you to be able to do that in the kind of the online community. Um, and so this was one of the things that we saw as an interesting opportunity. And Facebook is used by over 1.3 billion people, um, so we can enable them to help them express them, kind of what they care about. 
then the, then the second step comes in. It's like, oh, okay, cool. This is so exciting. Like, with all these people do this, let's, you know, let's figure out something here. But the second big question is data. Um, how big is this? Can this be really big? Can we really, is this, is this something small where we kind of come up with a couple ideas and, and, and that's it? Or is this, this, could this be really big and exciting? Um, we didn't have perfect information, but we knew it was big enough already. And with the right ideas, we could make it really meaningful at the Facebook scale. Um, so we looked at a bunch of data, and I highly encourage you, no matter how big or small your user base, always kind of think about, like, if you see the pattern in research, how can this translate into bigger numbers? Whether it's your entire user base or maybe the potential of how it's going to grow, um, how it's happening in the real world, and could you, could you potentially grow your user base because this is already happening in the real world and they could do more of this online on, on using your product? Um, so, so step two is data, and then that leads me to step three and another uh, program quote. Um, let's look at something that people are trying to do and figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't suck. <laughs> it's very blunt, but it's very, very true um, because it's, it's, it's much easier to help people do what they're already doing easier than trying to get them to do something they're not doing at all, right? So when we looked at our product, and we look at this, we're like, this is a real person's profile. <laughs> uh, and we're like, whoa, like, this is like a lot of work to do, right? And, and so we're like, okay, well, what are, what are the current, current pain points of this person trying to represent their really like go blue? They're all about that. It's like, well, they have to go, we asked Stephanie, and she's like, well, I go online, I download an image, then I download another image, then I upload them, and I try to like crop them so they fit the, the certain um, layout, and just like really, like it's, they spend a lot of time doing it. Um, and it's not viral, so they put it up, and then they're all their friends like, how did you do this? And then they try to do it, boom, they may not have Photoshop. Um, so, so she ends up being the only one with this awesome profile. Um, so we looked at this and said, okay, cool, how do we make, help her like do this and make it not suck um, and, and when she's doing this. And so we brainstormed a bunch of ideas and uh, we came up with a few, and some of you may have seen these, but we came up with like a really, really, really scoped down M like MVP. And I'm talking about scoped down, like super scoped down. <laughs> uh, like one engineer and me and like a designer just kind of iterating on this. Uh, it took us about four weeks from brainstorming to a public test. Uh, and, and what we had is uh, just a few, so we said, okay, we can't really boil the ocean. We can't help, help everyone do this. We can't come up with all the, it's like, you can go broad, right? You can say like all the causes and all the sports teams and how do we make this really awesome? I said, no, let's just pick one or two and let's just see if we can make this really work. Um, and this was like August, I think, so college football. As you can already tell, I'm really into college football. College football is coming up. Um, so we reached out to a couple of teams or, or partners that we had. Uh, one of them was Gators, and it was Alabama, and a couple like Oregon Ducks, I think. Um, and, and we got an MVP out. It was okay. Just like put like a frame, and we what we really built was just a, uh, the the call to action at the bottom, and let's see if people use this thing. Like within a, like. The time that the pages posted this to the t like to the game, which was I think like a day or two, we had close to a million uses, and 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 this is like you could say like oh it's a Facebook scale, so of course like they have a lot of users. However, if you think about it, like how many people really care about Florida Gators, <laughs> maybe not that not a lot, but like not at the Facebook scale, right? So you, you really the 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 denominator wasn't that large. And with that said, still people were, were doing this and they were doing it at, the, at, the, at a scale that pointed us in the direction that we are going for something really exciting and big. Um, so this is the, the step four is always figure out what is like the minimum viable product within the like one user base or, or some, some group of people where you can test and see very quickly whether the thing is going to work or not. Um, and, and there are so many things we cut out of this product. I, like the list of things we cut out was probably 10 times longer than what we actually built. Um, and, and it's so much, actually at a bigger scale, it's, it's harder to cut things out because you have the resource and you can build, well, we could do this and we could do that and wouldn't it be nice? 
And we just, we, we had this focus on, let's, let's prove that this thing is actually gonna work first. Once we knew it's gonna work, um, and, and we got a bunch of press actually out of it, which was hilarious. Um, and and we, this is when we were like, okay, cool, this is, this is gonna be big. Of course, TechCrunch wrote about us. This is awesome. Um, then step five is actually figuring out the V1 of the product. So we're not talking about going from zero to 10. It's not like, let's take all the lists of things that we decided not to do for MVP and now build it. <laughs> let's take the next two or three things that were on like next P, you know, P1s, priority ones, and, and let's build those. Um, and then collect a lot of feedback. So what we decided to do here is empower more organizations to connect with people in a whole new way um, to join movements around the world. Um, and so in October 2015, this is about two months later, we launched this, what we call the beta platform for profile pick frames that come from verified pages. Um, so we didn't go to all the pages. We only went to verified pages and only subset of them. And we said, hey guys, we built this platform. You can create your own frame and you can put it out to your, to your, um, to your fans. And we got this overwhelming, just positive response from partners, everyone from uh, all the sports teams, I mean, FC Barcelona, Real Madrid, each of those pages have over 80 million fans, um, different movie studios, uh, sp other sports teams, NFL, NBA, et cetera. So we knew that there is, there, there is excitement on their end. And then um, one of the, the first frames that we also launched was uh, French flag overlay that came directly from the Facebook's main page um, in support, this was in, the, in November of 2015, in support of the victims of the attacks in Paris. Um, and we just were absolutely overwhelmed by the adoption of, of this frame. There were over 120 million people who used it in just two days. And this, is, this was just a moment of solidarity uh, that everyone around the, the, the 120 million people were coming from all over the world. And it was just like, true, like for us, as a, still a very small team. It was like truly moving to see so many people coming together in this really dark moment in the real world to connect via our platform and to really show support. And so this really overwhelming adoption showed us that we need to create a scalable solution um, that uh, for any organization to connect with their fans and to start movements at a global scale, because this platform could really power that. And we also knew that we can't possibly then create frames or, or art uh, for every occasion, a partner or organization to support all the billions of people. And this, this was a time, this was a moment where we knew we had to build the one to 10 product. We really needed to build this the, the fully crowdsourced platform that does support every, all the causes and, and it enables people to, to show what they care about. And so the step six of this was building a fully scaled product. Uh, this took us a while. So we're talking from November to <clears throat> a few months later where we built a, a fully scaled platform that allowed anyone in the world to create a frame, whether you're a person or a page, um, to submit it into the system, it would get reviewed, and then it would become available. And so actually all of you can do it today if you want to. Um, and we have frames for all types of things, like small high schools in the middle of nowhere for their like girls teams, a chess tournament, um, just all types of things. And we, at this point, we, we knew that it was a time to, we actually had a product market fit. It was a time to, to go that one to 10 step. Um, and this is just a sample of, of some of the frames that currently live in what we call the crowdsourced store. Um, all of them are crowdsourced and they change, they change all the time based on what's happening in the world, what people care about. Um, et cetera. And now the, this product is one of the more adapted products. People use it all the time, both to create frames and also to just like for Christmas coming up, a lot of people are putting up their like holiday mood and expressing that, um, which is really exciting for us as, uh, as a team. And so this is kind of one example 
uh, of many different ways and there are many different examples of how you can build a product that really thinks of and focuses on the people problems first. So, this, so we'll, what we talked about, just to recap, first starting with research, um, what are people doing today? I would have not, for life of me, came up with that idea just sitting randomly and, and thinking, like, what should profile team do? Research would have really powered that. It was big enough with looking at data. Um, we, we saw the pain points in the current flows. Um, we built an MVP very, very quickly. Um, and this is, like, so important. You have to be able to get out something. The step four is very important. You have to get out something very quickly and get that feedback. Um, and then, only then, you build a more scalable version, but you don't do the feature creep. Like, still focus on what is important, what are the hypotheses you're trying to prove or disprove. And only then, you're iterating, getting more feedback, and then you, like, the last step is shipping a fully scaled product when you know there is a product market fit. And that's how you can survive also the startup life and, and be nimble and not get into a feature creep. Um, so, so this is an example of, of uh, how I did Facebook, how I learned uh, about kind of this people-first approach. And I'm um, happy to now open up to questions. Thank you. For... How did you decide um, which, which items to build as far as the MVP? Like, you said, like, uh, you know, evidence for presentation in Tech Florida and probably a couple other teams. Yeah. Like, why, why those teams? The teams, we, the teams were pretty random. Those were more like where we had... We, we looked at, well, the numbers did play a little bit of a role where we looked at which teams had a, you know, a decent amount of fan base um, in terms of like the page has at least over 100,000 fans. So we know there's, there's some, some foundation. The Facebook pages, right. So when we partnered with them, we would have like the Florida Gators page would actually make a post with the frame attached to a post. And then that post had that CTA, the try it, a button at the bottom and so like when the fans would see it like they could update their profile picture and then when they updated then their friends would see it and that's kind of like that was like the, the key component that we wanted to build is a viral factor that once you seed it into the system and then people can start updating would that create kind of the network effect and get more people to do it and actually we also saw a lot more people ended up following these pages as a result of, of this because they would see their friends do it they're like oh cool this is such so awesome and can you maybe grab a little bit how you went about to create the Kiss and Sally uh, frame? And I mean, how, how did it work back in uh, at Facebook? I mean, you, you obviously you got the news, there's this attack. Was it, was it the user who asked you or, or a, pe a, a person who asked you? Or? Well, we, we, we didn't have a platform at a time. Uh -huh. um, and, and this happened and we felt like this was a moment where or platform could really help uh, unite people and help people express solidarity. Um, and it was also something that was like very timely, so we, we had to get something out quickly. The flag overlay, uh, we already did something similar before with Pride. Um, so, so this kind of followed that pattern. Yeah. And then the Facebook page made the post with the flag. And then anyone, we had a, a little over 150 million followers of the page, I think. Um, so anyone who saw it, they adapted it, and then their friends could see that kind of update, and then it went viral. Yeah. So in terms of Uh, it's a great question. There's a lot of feedback. <laughs> um, we use, so we actually have like a, a system where you can um, file bugs. So actually like our end users can, can report bugs or can report their feedback. Um, and we have, we, so we get those. Uh, we also look at, uh, I mean, obviously we do a lot of research. So we bring people in, in house. We do remote research and interviews um, and then also data. So just looking at patterns, what's happening um, across the board, and kind of like combining those three three things together is how we prioritize. Uh, was there a system that was able to do like research 
know you mentioned like interviews and stuff, but like, did one of the seven people you interviewed in the beginning was like, oh yeah, I see some cool stuff like all the time. You know, or, or was it like yeah. you sorted through like hundreds of profiles and like, oh wait, people do this. You know what I mean? Um, we, it's kind of was a combination of both. So like we heard a couple of, couple of times in research enough to say like, wow, this is interesting. And then we looked at data. Um, so it would, it was because like we don't classify, if you just upload a profile picture that is like, let's say, uh, uh, you know, go blue. We don't know if it's go blue or if it's just a regular profile picture necessarily. So once we knew that there is something going on there, then, then we looked at data and so, to see if there's actually a pattern. Um, we had a hunch from the beginning that that's where we need to go eventually, uh, but probably within the first months or two, once we, you know, once you do go blue or gators, all the, all these other schools, right? Say like, well, what about me? And once you do one cause, and it's like, what what about all these other causes? And that's when we knew there's no way we can design for every cause. There's no way we can even guess what every single person really cares about. Um, and, and so pretty quickly we knew this is the direction we need to, to go into. Yeah. There's a question in the back. Um, what were your KPIs and um, how did you know it was big enough to do it? Like if the MVP was maybe a thousand people did it, mm -hmm. a thousand people, like where, how would you have determined it was good enough or not? We would probably look at, um, we looked at kind of how many people did it, uh, versus how many people were exposed to it um, or had an opportunity to do it. It depends product by product. Uh, I mean, in this case, we had over a million people do it within the first week. Um, so it was pretty clear that th this could be pretty big. Um, if it was a couple of thousand, it really depends at that point how much we, we felt like we want to, you know, Maybe one thing in, in that case, when you get kind of results that are lukewarm at the early stage, is to go back and say, did we actually, um, did we execute perfectly? Did we pick the right audience? Were there any biases? Uh, were there any bugs? Were there any other issues? Uh, before kind of like giving up on it just based on numbers. Yeah. Um, from this six step process, mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is the average length let's say from inception to iterated release, and what would you say is the section that you spend most time? Hmm. Um, I mean, there's no average length, to be honest. Um, I would say the, the, the step from um, once you have the research and data to actually building the MVP should not be more than two to six weeks because you really want to get something out quickly and get that feedback. Um, the research and data part may take, actually I often encourage people to take your time, make sure you, you really understand. Don't, it's so easy to jump to assumptions. Once you hear something that potentially is like exciting to you and the idea you're like, oh yeah, like I, I, I'm absolutely a genius. <laughs> I already thought about this. It's, it's very tempting to jump in and start building, but that's really actually the stage where you should Kind of avoid that urge and make sure that you you really understand and validate it. So the, the step one and two could take longer than actually step three of building, for example. And then from 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 that to building out a fully kind of full full product, the one to ten product, that could take a while. That actually the, the last step probably took the longest for us, but it's because we wanted to we iterated a bunch. We were looking at data. What were people? Like where are the drop-offs? What's happening? Doing a little bit more research, understanding um, kind of what were the pain points? Where are the products sucked now that we build it? Um, and, and really getting kind of the right flow. Got a question there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you give an example of a, like a bad um, like a product management um, test you did that which actually <coughs> failed? Management test we did that failed. Um, uh, 
Let me think about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll get back to you. I'm, I'm going to think about it. Let's one sec. Yeah. Um, a similar question. Um, so there's, there's some features that Facebook in general has pulled back uh -huh. and removed. And um, so let's say in the case of, uh, you said you know, people put the Gator Spring mm -hmm. on, and then the number of likes to the Gator's page increased. Mm -hmm. Let's say, if, for example, let's say that was negative in four days. Mm. For some, see if we do this, and then behaviors that drive our revenue decrease. How do we, how do you pull things back? Um, it, what, what, like what, what is the process? Yeah. In your, in your job, that, uh, get things to be pulled off. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a as a PM, um, you are you're responsible not just for the success of your product, but for the success of the overall health of, of the app and, and the product um, and the system. So we, all, we always have counter metrics and, and top level metrics that we look at. And if we're significantly negative, your product's significantly negatively impacting something, uh, the first step is to figure out why, right? What is happening? What, what is, what, how are you changing user behavior that is so negatively impacting um, a product or, 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 or a metric? And then if, if it truly is like, this is just a trade-off, um, then you, um, you have to think about like, what is your recommendation? Like a lot of times as a PM, even if it's a successful thing for your product, you actually say like, no, I, this is not the right thing for the system because of this trade-off, so we're gonna pull this back. Um, but sometimes you may feel pretty strongly that this is the right trade-off to make and, and you have that discussion with other product managers or the leadership and then you figure out kind of what to do next. It depends. It, yeah. It depends. Uh, it depends on depends on the button. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a question in the back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering, like, you know, and and for for a lot of companies, like, it's easy to gather like really qualitative insights from research, but mm -hmm. it's hard to like actually tie that to like numerical like business case totally. or potential. So like, I mean, how did you identify that there is enough like uh, enough people changing their profiles to cause this profile pictures to mm -hmm. cause quantify that or like is it just because it depends on your research insights on photo analysis or like yeah um <laughs> I, I mean i had a startup so i can totally relate to <laughs> lack of data uh, or bad data um i think it's so so it's, it's a combination when i say like the step two of data it doesn't necessarily have to be like you have all this wealth of data as like your you know, your users are doing this thing um, a lot of times it is looking at the competition or even how they're doing it in the real world could this could could this be really really big um, and and it doesn't necessarily have to be happening on your platform today and so a lot of times it, it's a combination of kind of understanding the market um, uh, landscape and also intuition um, and this is where like we the big part of this was actually intuition from from our side where we felt pretty strongly that like people really really care about these things and like if they do if they go out of their way to paint their face in the real world like they are likely to click a button to show how they how they feel on on our um, platform and so it's kind of a combination it, it, with the lack of data it's coming from intuition and then any data you can find <laughs> to validate it Yeah, um, going back to your question. So, um, no, no, it's, I, I, I was thinking in the back of my mind. Um, well, I, I mean, I definitely can talk about um, my startup, which I didn't really cover much, uh, where my product management experience <laughs> didn't go so well. 
Um, and, uh, and so what, one of the ideas we had, the original idea was around uh, building a platform to connect travelers with like-minded locals. And so the hypothesis we had is that like, imagine like when you travel, instead of just going you know, on, on the top 10 things to do, you can actually meet someone who is similar age, has similar interests, and, and you could kind of almost have like a local friend anywhere you go. And hypothetically, when we pitched this, everyone loved it. I was like, yeah, like, I would totally use this. It's so great. I'm such a worldly person. Um, and, then, and we built the, the first version of it. Um, and, uh, and we had a bunch of actually local sign up, which we thought was going to be the bigger problem, is getting locals interested. A bunch of local sign up were like, yeah, we, we're so excited. We're, we're here in like Jakarta. We want all these like, Westerners coming here and like to get to meet them and practice our English. And then, and then we're trying to market it to travelers, and they're just like, yeah. I mean, they would sign up, and then, but then when they go there, they're like, they actually want to do the top 10 things to do. <laughs> they don't want to go off the beaten path, even though they tell us that, uh, even in research, right? They're, they would be like, yeah, like I I'm totally worldly, and I want like that like, hole in the wall place. Actually, no. And so this is one of the, like, it, it, and as a small startup, it's like, terrifying when you, you've realized you did you know, spent all this time building a product and there's no product market fit and you have to like write these like updates to your investors and like this thing is not working we're gonna have to pivot um and and that was that was pretty hard but the numbers were so clear and like when we did that that we knew that we had to pivot Twitter, <laughs> I guess it makes me feel better. <laughs> Thank you. It's a good point. Um, so before the MVP, like, can you maybe mention like how to develop that and then like, or how to build the MVP first and like which you should prioritize mm -hmm. and whatnot? Like, um, how fleshed out were those ideas? Um, and then like, did it change over time? I guess. It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> how fleshed out were those ideas? Um, <clears throat> they were. Um, they we, we ha what was fleshed out was the key hypotheses we had. Um, like we knew what were the questions we needed to answer to actually like know if we can even convince to put more people in this thing and like grow this, this product. <clears throat> the actual ideas changed a bunch. I mean, we had the like the early like. The early, early idea that how it's going to work, and and then we put it out in front of people, and they like did not understand. <laughs> um, even like everything from the copy, like what the copy said, um, and even to this day, I like a bunch of people think this frame, this art. There's, there's a ton of art in the system. A lot of people think that Facebook makes them, right? And we've done everything we could to try to communicate that. This is done by the Gators page, and this is done by FC Barcelona, et cetera. And that is still an ongoing kind of uh, product iteration on our side. So a lot of things have changed from like the early days. But what, what's really important is to know like one or two things you absolutely have to prove are working in order to kind of move on to the next stage. Yeah. Um, so we actually have this really awesome thing called hackathons. Um, so I pitched this to like I, I just need two or three people on my team who probably would be interested. Um, and student engineers were super interested in helping out. And so this actually started as a hackathon where we have like tw you basically have twenty four hours to build whatever you want, and then you everyone gets to present it in front of this kind of like a group of judges that are picked uh, by the committee, the hackathon committee. And then from there, they pick the top uh, projects and you get, get to pitch them to Mark. Um, so, so that's how we got to, and we also internally like show them to all our VP, like here's the stuff that we came up with in our hackathon. Um, and that's how we got the early kind of pitch. Um, in terms of like pitching in, uh, engineers and designers, um, I, 
a lot of it was like uh, trying to identify who was interested in like causes or sports and just being like, wouldn't you want FC Barcelona for him on profile? And then the, like how, helping them kind of envision, get, a, get, a, get as excited as you are um, and pitching it kind of from their angle and, uh, and then taking it from there. So that's how like actually, yeah, like the first two guys I pitched, they, they, were, they just bought into the, the sports idea and we took it from there. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, I, I mean, I think like once you get to that stage of like maturity of the product, so we definitely passed the product market fit, and we felt like we, a lot of times it's not like there's never a stage where you're just like completely done, done, where you like um, you're always iterating, always getting feedback. Um, but I think when you get to a place where you feel like this, like People, it's, it's working on its own. People are using it. Um, we we got into a place where we feel like actually internally proud of the product we've done. We feel like this is this is like this is the baby we're really proud of. Um, that's usually the station. And there's also like, well, what are the opportunity costs, right? What else we could be working? on? What are the priorities? That's how we shuffle things around. Yeah. You mentioned that this one came out on that hackathon. Um, we do use design sprint uh, cycles. Uh, we did not use it for, for in this particular case. Um, but we, yeah, it depends on the scale of the project. Um, I think like usually something medium scale, we would use like a design sprint, um, something smaller, like it was hackathon ideas. A lot of times you don't even have the resources to run a design sprint. Like five day thing was like, and like fifth day being the in lab research. Um, a lot of times you just kind of hack something together and get it in front of the employees, which is an enough usually to get feedback. Um, and then you take it from there. But you were saying, sorry, um, when is it best to use a design sprint? Oh, well, sorry. for. In this case, it was it, we just it, we did not have it, and mostly because we didn't have the resources. Um, we would use a design sprint in the cases where we already have, for example, a buy-in um, from kind of from leadership or from our management to to um, to make a, a change or a bigger change or there's initiative or something that like we really need to go tackle. Then you have a bigger group of people because design sprint requires five days and you need cross-functional partners and. Kind of a whole spectrum of, of things. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm kind of curious from a process perspective. Um, how many levels of management of each of the people to like push this stuff? Or was it just like you mentioned there was like three people? Oh. Did you guys like push it live? I'm just curious, like at a Facebook, mm. do you have to like constantly get stakeholders involved instead of peer review? And, you know. It's pretty like, I mean, that's the most awesome part about Facebook is just super move fast. Anyone can push code. Um, you have to get your, your code reviewed by a peer, um, but usually, like, you probably wouldn't be able to push it 100% of the world, uh, but a small test is pretty, like you may need a, depending on like what team you're on, you may need a buy-in from like, from like, for example, if you're on a profile team, you may need a buy-in from profile leads, like me and my Eng counterpart. Um, but you may not need like a buy-in from from all of the leadership. But it's something bigger. It depends. Like if you want to go like 100% of a country or like 100% of the world, or it's a bigger change that can impact other teams or the, the product overall, then then yeah. Depending on the complexity, you need more and more buy-in. Uh, so, so you're saying like for just like the data from the US side, just for the that itself, but then when you say pitching mark, that was for Yeah. Yeah. It's it's uh, less. It was le it's less about like the the frame itself, and it was more like how like so for example the Gators thing like only uh, only like U.S. We, we were op only open to users in the U.S. for example, uh, but if we were to roll out globally, it would be something that would need more cross functional buy-in, or like more leadership buy-in. Cool.
think we're out of questions. How many different cartoons are there in the space that you know? Uh, a lot. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know how many there are. It depends on how you find product team. For, I mean, for profile, we're one product team, like a profile product team. Um, but there are, there are many, many dozens of product teams. There's, like, I mean, there's Messenger, there's Newsfeed, there's Instagram. Um, groups, there's just like so many. Yeah. Are you noticing at all um, with the kind of environment we're in right now, political environment, um, a rise at all in, in more fringe groups? F French, French groups? French groups, like with profiles or something, say they're creating something like a more I mean, I personally haven't, yeah. um, so no. But I'm sure yeah. there's something yeah. happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You mentioned um, uh, hypothesis. Do you have a pipeline of hypothesis to kind of speed up, you know, like user stories and how mm. to do that? Do you have that? Mm. That get more fleshed out and vetted uh, before you say, okay, let's get engineering resources on this thing or more like platform resources. Yeah, yeah. We do, uh, we do have a bunch of hypotheses. We, we have always rolling research. There's always some kind of new, new information coming in, and we want to make sure we capture all of it. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, and the same was uh, kind of ideas. Um, and it all gets prioritized based on a number of different things, like 